according to a, a recent report. We've also seen him tweet in the last uh, couple of days that Democrats are the, quote, anti-Jewish party. Does, does the president really believe Democrats hate Jews? Look, the president's been an unwavering and committed ally to Israel and the Jewish people. And uh, frankly, the remarks that have been made by a number of Democrats and failed to be called out by Democrat leadership is frankly abhorrent and it's sad. And it's something that uh, should be called by name. It but shouldn't but, but be put in a watered down resolution. It should be done the way the Republicans did it when Steve King made terrible comments. We called it out by name. We stripped him of his committee memberships. And we'd like to see Democrats follow suit. But, 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 but I ask, first of all, you mentioned Steve King, the president correct me if I'm wrong, has not condemned Steve King. I, I what he said, praising white supremacy. Has the president publicly come out and said anything I, to I criticize speak on behalf or condemn? I the president on a number of topics, and I've talked about that a number of times, and I'd refer you back to those comments where I used words like abhorrent uh, and unacceptable. Sarah? John? Sarah. Uh, we're getting some word that the president plans to nominate Patrick Shanahan. Uh, later this week to be the Secretary of Defense, uh, elevating him from the acting position. Can you tell us whether or not that is going to happen? Uh, I'm not going to uh, make any personnel announcements at this time. I can tell you that the president has a great deal of respect uh, for acting Defense Secretary Shanahan. He likes him. And um, when the president's ready to make an announcement on that front, he certainly will. Just one, one, uh, there, there are a lot of actings in the administration these days. Any, any possibility of removing acting from Mick Mulvaney's title? Uh, certainly uh, a lot of possibility there. Some of the reason that we have actings is because we're waiting on uh, the confirmation process, at least for a couple of those folks, and we hope that that moves forward quickly. Sure. Sarah. Sarah, um, I wanted to follow up on what the latest with China is. Has the president made an offer for a Mar-a-Lago date? Um, and there's also some reports that the Chinese feel the president's an unreliable negotiating partner after walking out well, of the North Korea talks. Let me start with the first one. Uh, in terms of whether or not we have a date set, um, not yet. We're continuing the negotiations with China. When we have an announcement uh, for the two leaders to sit down, we'll certainly let you know. And what would part. you say to the concerns by the Chinese that the president's an unreliable negotiating partner uh, after the talks with North Korea broke down? And he I, I would say that's absurd. The president is going to make a deal if it's a good deal. He's going to make a, good, a deal if it's in the best interest of America. And if he doesn't feel like it's a good deal, it's not worth uh, just signing a piece of paper. And the president didn't feel like what was on the table was enough. The president's 100 percent committed to denuclearization of the peninsula. And he's going to make sure that whatever we do furthers that process. Um, we'll see what happens with North Korea the same way we're going to see what happens in the negotiations with China. They're ongoing. And the president's going to make sure whatever deal we get is in our best interest, that it's fair and reciprocal trade, that it protects our intellectual property, and that it actually uh, has safeguards to make sure that the Chinese um, follow through with whatever commitments that they make. Sarah. Blake. Sarah, picking up on that, does the president have any plans to speak with President Xi? over the phone? Uh, I'm not aware of any scheduled calls, but if we have any, we'll certainly keep you posted. Is, is that the most likely step here, that, that they speak on the phone beforehand, or is it possible that these two still meet at the end of the month or the beginning? Uh, we're going to keep everything on the table. Uh, again, negotiations are ongoing. Uh, the president's team, as well as the Chinese delegation, continue conversations. And when they feel like it's time for the two leaders to sit down, we'll make that happen. Francesca. Yeah. Thanks, Sarah. I have a news of the day question, but I didn't get asked my budget question before so can I try you missed a big one? moment I, I the did. guy with well, all the details all right, so in, in the budget, the way that I see it, and there's a lot of pages to go through, it keeps referring to Western Hemisphere with regards to, to the foreign aid spending, um, but nothing specifically about Central America. The president has said that he wants to cut money to Central America. In fact, he could cut it all. Is that in the budget? Is that uh, the I don't have any specific update on that front. I don't think there's a, a different policy. Right, on, the news, on, on the news today, today the big votes coming up this week in the Senate on the resolution with regards to the national emergency. What is the president doing to uh, stop a rebellion among Republican senators? We know that a rising number has been reported as many as 10 or 15 could vote against that. What's the president doing about that? He's doing his job. He's doing what Congress should be doing. He took an oath of office, and he has a constitutional duty to protect the people of this country. We have a humanitarian and national security crisis at our border, and the president's doing his job in addressing it. He gave Congress a number of opportunities opportunities to actually address it, and they failed to do so. So the pre 
president is taking his constitutional authority that Congress granted him. Let's not forget the only reason he has the authority to call a national emergency is because Congress gave him the right to do so. They failed to do their job. The president's fulfilling his duty, and he's going to make sure he does what is necessary to protect the people of this country, secure our borders. I remember the calls and meetings that he might be taking with senators who he believes could be voting for that resolution. Yeah, certainly, we talked to a number of members every single day, uh, certainly at the presidential and the staff level, and we're going to continue to engage with them in this process. Sarah? Sarah, what is the administration specifically doing to look into Secretary Acosta's role in the secret plea deal for Jeffrey Epstein? Does the president have any misgivings about the role that this top official played in this deal? Uh, that's currently under review. Because of that, I can't get into a lot of specifics, but we're certainly looking at it. How it's a timeline for that review, sir? Uh, I'm not aware of a specific timeline. So I have a question for you, but I also have a follow-up to a colleague, because I didn't hear you actually answer the question. So yes or no, does the president truly believe that Democrats hate Jews? Uh, I am not going to comment on a potentially leaked document. I can tell you what so I can does he, tell does he you. Think Democrats hate Jewish people, as he said on the South. I think that Democrats. they've had a lot of opportunities over the last few weeks to condemn some abhorrent comments. I'm trying to answer. If you'd stop talking, I'll, I'll finish my statement. The president has had. Uh, and laid out clearly his position on this matter. Democrats have had a number of opportunities to condemn specific comments and have refused to do that. That's a question, frankly, I think you should ask Democrats what their position is, since they're unwilling to call this what it is and call it out by name and take actual action yes. against members uh, who have done things like this, like the Republicans have done when they had the same opportunity. So I want to ask about Paul Manafort, but I just want to be very clear. You're not answering the question. Is there a reason? I believe I answered it twice. You didn't say yes or no. Does he really believe Democrats hate Jews? I'm just trying to get a sense of that. I think that's a question you ought to ask the Democrats. Uh, let me ask you about Paul Manafort. Why hasn't, obviously Paul Manafort goes for the second half of the sentencing this week, why hasn't the president ruled out a pardon for Paul Manafort? Uh, the president has made his position on that clear, and he'll make a decision when he's ready. So, yeah. on, on pardons, last week the president tweeted that Michael Cohen, quote, directly asked me for a pardon. When did that happen? Was that when Co was Cohen here at the White House and came into the Oval Office and asked the president for a pardon? Did it happen on the phone? Do you have a date? Do we know uh, when that I'm not going to get into spe specifics of things that are uh, currently under review by the Oversight Committee and other committees. What I can tell you is uh, that Cohen's own attorney stated and contradicted his client when he said uh, that he was aware that those conversations had taken place. We know that Michael Cohen lied to Congress uh, prior to his testimony most recently, and we know that he's lied at least twice in that hearing. I think that it's time to stop giving him a platform, uh, let him go on to serve his time, and let's move forward with Thanks. matters one budget question, just to put it on the record, because a lot of people in the country want to know, is there anything in the president's 2020 budget request that has Mexico paying for the wall? Uh, as the president has stated a number of times uh, through the USMCA uh, trade deal that we look forward to getting passed soon, that'll be part of how that takes place. John? Thank you, Sarah. Two brief questions. Following up on John's personnel question, does the president have full confidence in Secretary Acosta? or is the Labor Secretary possibly leaving? Uh, I'm not aware of any personnel changes, but again, uh, those things are currently under review. When we have an update, I'll let you know. The other question is, is the President in discussion about signing an executive order to undo Executive Order 13166, President Clinton's executive order requiring President Clinton's executive order 19 years ago requiring multiple languages. Uh, a new executive order, I am told, would make English the official language in government. Uh, I'm, I'm not aware of a specific executive order that's been drafted, but uh, that is the position of the White House. Jim? Uh, yes, uh, did the President ask Gary Cohen to intervene or block AT&T's uh, merger with Time Warner? Uh, I'm not aware of any conversations around that matter. And uh, just to, to get back to, to John and, and Hallie's question about uh, the President's comments uh, about Democrats and Jewish people, uh, isn't that kind of rhetoric just sort of beneath everybody? And, and do you think that the President has thought at all uh, going into this 2020 campaign that the rhetoric just needs to be lowered, whether it's talking about Democrats, the media, immigrants, or should we just plan on hearing the president use the same kind of language that we heard in 2016 and all through the first couple of years of this administration? Uh, look, I, I think that the real 
uh, shame in all of this is that Democrats are perfectly capable of coming together and agreeing on the fact that they're comfortable ripping babies straight from a mother's womb or killing a baby after birth, but they have a hard time condemning the type of comments from Congresswoman Omar. Uh, I think that is a great shame. The president has been clear on what his position is, certainly what his support is for the people and the community of Israel. Um, and beyond that, I don't have anything further for you, Jim. that just sort of drags down the rhetoric in the debate when you're, you're saying something that's just patently untrue. I mean, obviously... Stating their policy de positions but, but is not Democrats don't, untrue. But Democrats don't hate Jewish people. It's just silly. It's not true. I think so, they should call out their members by name, and we've made that clear. I don't have anything further. Yeah, yeah. April? President, yeah. But the President, you know, Sorry, he, he, April his rhetoric Roman. after Charlottesville saying that there are very fine people on both sides in Charlottesville, essentially suggesting that there are very fine people in the Nazis. Uh, yeah. That's not at all you know, what the President was stating. Well, not, but, not then, but, not, not at any point. The President has been incredibly clear and consistently and repeatedly condemned hatred, bigotry, racism in all of its forms, whether it's in America or anywhere else. And to say otherwise is simply untrue. April. That's kind of along what I was asking two questions, but that's kind of along what I was asking. Since the president did say that in Charlottesville, some very fine people on both sides, has he, in your opinion, or has he, or us, because I don't remember it, condemned the neo-Nazis in Charlottesville for their actions against the Jewish Americans there? The president has condemned neo-Nazis and called them by name, which is what we are asking Democrats to do when they see the same type of hatred. Deborah, also, can, yeah, we sorry, can, can we, we Deborah, go ahead. More. Can we expect to have briefings more often now since there have been a little bit of changing atmosphere here? <laughs> I haven't noticed a change in the atmosphere. Uh, I know that the president's the most accessible president in modern history. I know that he takes questions from you guys nearly every single day, and on days he doesn't. Sometimes I do it from here. We answer hundreds of questions from reporters all over the world every day. We're going to continue to do that. Sometimes we'll do it from this room. Sometimes we'll do it in other venues and other platforms. Uh, yeah. and let me, um, in the new spending uh, blueprint, the OMB, why did the OMB include money for the Yucca Mountain? I'm sorry, can you say a little louder? Yes, I can. Um, why did the OMB include money for the Yucca Mountain Waste Nuclear Waste Repository? And what are the chances, it's in, it's in your, your spending blueprint, and what are the chances that Congress will actually enact that? Uh, I think that the chances that Congress will do its job based on historical precedent over the last couple of months are probably <laughs> unlikely, but that doesn't mean we're not hopeful that they will work with us, um, look for ways that we can re reduce spending and grow, our, protect our military, do things like that, that which you see in the president's budget. We'd love for them to work with us on that. Can you tell us a little bit about what the thinking was to put that in? Uh, I'm not aware of any specific policy changes on that front or anything on there. I'll let you know if we have something. One last question, Paul. Sarah, why did the president write a check to Michael Cullen for $35,000 in August of 2017 while he was here in the White House? What was that money for? Uh, I'm not aware of those specific um, He testified changes. about this. He specifically accused the president of engaging in a conspiracy to conceal campaign finance violations. He presented the check. The president's been clear that there wasn't a campaign violation beyond that. Uh, I can't get it. He didn't know about these hush money. On that, I can't, uh, again, I would refer you back to the president's comments. That's not something I'm a part of. And I would refer you to the president's outside counsel beyond his so comments. He did during his time at the White House. Does the White House deny that the president is individual one? I'm sorry? Individual one in the Southern District of uh, New York. Again, I'm not going to comment on that an, on an ongoing case. That's not something I would be a part of here at the White House. And I would refer you to the outside counsel. What I can tell you is the president has stated his position and made it clear. Thanks so, so much, guys. Sir, why did the president deny saying something that was caught on tape? All right, so there you have it. After 42 days, we got a briefing from the White House. Uh, Sarah Sanders there at the podium answering all, all kinds of questions from this upcoming vote this week on the national emergency and the Republican rebellion to uh, Paul Manafort to North Korea. Korea. So uh, John Avalon and Maya McGinnis are with me. And, and John, I want to start really with what seemed to be the thrust of that whole conversation, right? And a lot of questions came uh, to Sarah Sanders on comments that the president made on Friday uh, about Democrats being anti-Israel, uh, anti anti-Jewish. Anti so in case you missed this, this is what the president said. And I thought that vote was a disgrace. And so does everybody else if you get an honest answer. If you get an honest answer from politicians, they thought it was a disgrace. The Democrats have become an anti-Israel party. They've become an anti-Jewish party. And that's too bad. So 
I know, I know, I know, I know. Who and are you going to believe? And then when, when though Sarah was pressed on the president's comments <clears throat> there, she compared the Congresswoman Ilhan Omar situation to that of Congressman Steve King, uh, the myriad racist comments he's made, and the point simply being, where, where was Trump on Steve King? Yeah, exactly. I mean, that was her pushback was that, you know, the Republicans censured Steve King, took away his committees. How come the Democrats couldn't pop? Trump said nothing. Uh, yeah, that's, point. that's the kicker. Yeah. <laughs> that, that, that's the kicker that they weren't apparently ready for in the White House by invoking the example that Republicans tried to set with Steve King. Crickets, tumbleweeds, silence from the president. Um, and, and, of course, when, you know, when she says, you know, trying to deny the president said what we all heard him say on camera, which is that he's consistently condemned hatred and bigotry in all its forms to say anything else is a lie. Again, we all know the example of Charlottesville, among many, many others. The neo-Nazis came up. Why didn't he condemn them? Yeah, this, this is not... Both sides. Both sides, people. That's not really a tough one, but apparently it was for the president who kept going back to that particular talking point. So, again, you see the White House in a situation where the best they've got is trying to uh, assert something that the president's own words uh, makes it fall apart. Let me just look down at my notes. Uh, that she was asked about the Paul Manafort, right? The the fact that he was, um, we know that he was sentenced last week. Some thought that it was lenient. He'll be sentenced uh, on the whole, the the lying and the, the plea deal this this coming Wednesday. Would he would he not be pardoned? Did she she didn't she didn't totally rule it out? If I heard that correctly, right? In fact, it, she doubled down on Trump's claim that Cohen asked him directly for a pardon. Br brought it back to that. I think you get the, the classic White House. The president's been very clear on this when the whole point is that, no, he is not. But when you got nothing, that's the best you can do is cite a, a sort of largely fictitious past standard. Um, no, th that door still apparently is open. Or Sarah Sanders didn't have the uh, clarity or authority to speak on behalf of the president conclusively to it. Um, Big deal. I've got a question for... Maya, do we have Maya on budgets? Maya, um, here, here's my question for you on this whole with, with it, within today. Obviously, the news is the fact that Trump released his budget uh, to Congress, uh, projected to balance the budget in, in 15 years, cutting funding for almost all federal agencies by $2.7 trillion. The biggie that everyone's latching onto today, obviously, is the $8.6 billion for construction of the border wall. You know, there was a question again from one of the reporters today, is Mexico going to pay for it? Uh, newsflash, no. Um, why do you think the president is bringing this up again? Is, is it about the fight for 2020? Is it about needing the money? What do you think? Right. Well, I think the fact that the wall is going to be what gets so much attention when this is the president putting out what's supposed to be the whole blueprint for the, how we would guide the country forward. But the reality is that the budget has become less and less serious. And this just kind of demonstrates this, that this will have a big political fight over the wall. And nobody will notice a couple really key things here. This is a president who for many years was quite critical of President Obama and all the debt he added. But this budget would add another seven and a half trillion dollars to the national debt over the next decade. And if you use realistic numbers, which its growth numbers are way too aggressive, closer to ten and a half trillion dollars. So it's kind of look at the sparkly thing over here, create a fight. And unfortunately, our entire budget process, which is really important to the governance of the country, is becoming less and less important and not being taken very seriously. Let me play something for you because we, we, we took live the Q&A with Sarah Sanders. Prior to that, um, Russ Vaught, the uh, new OMB director, spoke. And so I want to play what he said specifically about the deficit. Washington has a spending problem, and it endangers the future prosperity of our nation for generations to come. So we also said that it gets harder to, to balance the budget every year. Congress doesn't go along with, with their sp spending plan. So my question to you is, is it, is it Congress's fault? Is it the White House's fault? Uh, you know, the administration asking for a 5% increase in, in defense spending to $750 billion. Um, here's what he had to say about that. And to be clear, this is not funding for endless wars. This is for research and development and procurement to fund the most awe-inspiring military the world has ever known. So the other piece of this is, you know, at a time when the U.S. is pulling out of Syria, Afghanistan, where, where would the money go? Right. So let's be, let's be real about the problems in Washington. We have a spending problem and we have a revenue problem. And this budget doesn't really address either of them seriously in that it extends all of the tax cuts in the baseline and doesn't pay for them. So that makes our revenue problem even worse. 
and it ignores the biggest drivers of our national debt, the bigger program, Social Security. It, it does do some health care savings, um, but it would need to do more. And it doesn't get serious about the parts of the budget that are going to actually fix the problem. So the focus on very small domestic discretionary savings, which in reality aren't going to happen and are not going to be paired with big increases in defense, and some of the welfare programs, are, which are targeted in a way that Democrats will never go along with, means we're still not being serious about the big question, which is, how, if you want to spend more money, are you going to pay for it? And how are we not going to continue this endless cycle of borrowing that's causing our debt to grow even faster than our economy, that's going to leave us very weak for all the future challenges, including a potentially a recession, that we're going to face at some point? Yes. Yes, listening to you, seeing John Avalon nodding oh, yes. aggressively out of the corner of my eye. But I've got Jim Acosta standing by, our chief White House correspondent, who got a couple of questions in uh, to Sarah yeah. Sanders at the briefing. And so, you, I mean, I loved your question yeah. about ratcheting down the rhetoric ahead of 2020. Yeah. But of, of all of the above, what stood out most to you, Jim? Well, I, you know, the, this is part of the reason why we've seen the, the White House briefings, you know, get scaled down over the last uh, several months. Uh, there, there are just so many difficult questions for this White House to answer. Uh, but you, you saw Sarah Sanders there, and, and uh, to her credit, she did take multiple questions from uh, several reporters, uh, my colleagues over at NBC and uh, ABC uh, and so on, and were able to ask uh, several follow-up questions on some pretty pointed issues. I think this, this issue of the president referring to Democrats as anti-Jewish or hating Jewish people, I mean, I think that just naturally is going to uh, dredge up uh, some of his own questions fr from his past, uh, you know, the days after after Charlottesville when he uh, said that there were very fine people on both sides down in Charlottesville. I mean, that is a comment that is just going to live on forever, uh, no matter what they say over here at the White House. And I and I do think it's important to, to say and, and not even put it in the form of a question that obviously Democrats don't hate Jewish people. I mean, that is just a silly thing to say, but it just goes to where we're headed, I think, over the next, you know, 18 to 20, 24 months, Brooke. We are in for probably, and, it, and it, it, you know, is astonishing, I think, to say this and to hear it and so on, but we're in for probably the nastiest campaign that we've ever seen in our lifetimes coming up in 2020. And I wanted to ask, you know, whether or not the president plans on tamping down that rhetoric, because as we all know, uh, you know, he is he is largely responsible for this driving down of our political discourse, you know, going out and making speeches and saying that Democrats are anti-Jewish or hating Jewish people. I mean, that just goes uh, to pushing people's buttons in ways that, you know, the president of the United States really shouldn't be engaged in, in doing. But getting yeah. to, I think, some of the other critical questions in this briefing, uh, Brooke, I mean, some critical questions were asked about Michael Cohen. Uh, were asked about the Stormy Daniels payments, asked about Paul Manafort and whether or not he's going to receive a pardon. And you can see, again, going back to that issue of why they haven't had any briefings lately, there are just legal questions that are just going to twist any press secretary into a pretzel because obviously Sarah Sanders is not going to want to say something from the podium that might get her hauled into the special counsel's office, for example. Yeah. So there's just a whole host of issues that are difficult to deal with. I do think it's, I do think it's important when we were going through that uh, budget uh, with the OMB, acting OMB director, uh, you know, th you know, th this issue of the wall and the funding for the wall, they know that that is a political item over here at the White House. It was inserted into the budget uh, to spark another fight with Democrats. And, and, and they know inside the Trump campaign, it's one of the bread and butter, is butter issues going into the 2020 election. And so these these budgets tend to be almost more uh, political documents and fiscal documents. But, you know, the president did say during the 2016 campaign that he knows how to eliminate a budget deficit, that he knows how to trim the national debt, that he'll do it in eight years and so on. And a lot of those those comments coming back to haunt the president uh, like they do so oftentimes, Brooke. Yeah, well, the idea of budget or policy driven by political ideology, uh, we've seen that movie before, right, with, with presidents on, on both sides of the aisle. But Jim Acosta, thank you so That's much. Right. A lot happening yeah, there. Sure. It was nice to hear from Sarah Sanders trying to answer some of those questions. I'm John Avalon, I appreciate you.